All right, it is two, so we will get started um, for today. Um, so the test should be up um, and all the answers and all that should be up. I did notice a slight error in one of the multiple choices, uh, or rather somebody emailed me that there was um, an error in one of the multiple choices. So um, if you notice that your grade changed this morning, that's why I, I um, fixed that and then recalculated everything. So some grades might go up, some grades might go down. Um, and when I was doing that, I just you know recalculated everything to make sure um, all the grades were, were correct. So if you have questions about the grading of the test, um, feel free to send me an email. Uh, we can discuss that one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Um, I should have dropped the lowest score now. So the grades in Blackboard should reflect um, whatever test is the lowest being dropped currently. Um, I think the overall average on this test was like a 72-ish, 74, something like that. Um, Got one more test to go, I believe on December 2nd. I believe that's when our, our next test is. So it's not that far away, but the good thing is that it won't be that much material either. So um, test four can be really a test where if you've been uh, not getting the results that you'd hoped, Hopefully that test four will, you know, be less material and be able to make that make up uh, one of your test grades. Do really well on that test, and then after that we have the final exam. Um, and I will post the final exam date, like when it will be open. Um, right now I'm thinking of like allowing you to have it be open for two days, uh, 48 hours, because um, you know online classes and all that, but. Um, I'll let you know when I make that final decision here in a couple of weeks. But anyways, let's get to our lecture material. So I did move back the reading guide. So if you did the reading guide that um, was for today, um, I did. I noticed I didn't move that back until like this morning. Um, that means you don't have to do a reading guide until Wednesday. Um, if you haven't done it yet, well, that's that's fine because it'll be due Wednesday. And today we are doing some math. Those of you who love math, um, we're finally getting to it. Those of you who don't like math, it's not too bad. So just as a reminder, what we were talking about all the way back on Wednesday, we were talking about transportation. So we looked at some vesicles. Um, we talked about going from the Golgi to the plasma membrane, um, and we talked about proteins that can escape the ER and how they're shipped back. And we ended up talking about snares. Uh, snares are these uh, proteins that help to, um, when you have a vesicle coming near the plasma membrane, it'll help the wine uh, the snares will, will interact kind of like zip ties almost where you have winding, winding, winding. This helps to overcome um, the electrostatic barrier or interaction because these, these are negative lipids, right? And so the lipid on the vesicle and the plasma membrane will want to repel. So these snares help to bring them together. And it's over, also overcoming the desolvation period Remember, there should be water between our vesicle and our membrane. We have to get rid of that water for fusion to happen. Um, getting rid of that water is not a favorable process, and so our snares will help to get around that. Okay, so the next thing I'm going to be talking about is the idea of a snare-like protein on uh, the flu, uh, influenza. Uh, so influenza has a protein called hemagglutinin and the image is kind of weird. So let me, let me tell you what you're looking at at the bottom left here, right? So this blue, that's, that's the virus. So that's the virus, uh, cell wall, right? And the hemagglutin 
is this whole thing. And where these receptor binding sites are, that's where we're going to bind our, um, the target cell, um, our cells that the influenza will go and, and uh, invade. And they're looking for silic acid. So they're looking for cells with silic acid and they're gonna bind to that. And what happens is that once we have, once influenza binds um, the salic acid, this hemagglutinin goes through what's called like a jackknife um, type of rearrangement. So what happens is that this whole um, subunit kind of like jackknifes up. So like this kind of, kind of goes up here, this whole thing springs up here. Um, those of you who don't know what a jackknife is, um, a uh, jackknife is this instrument, right, where you have the knife folded in and then it can like spring out. Um, and that's kind of what we're, what we're thinking of, of when this protein binds, it kind of springs out. And what happens is that it is bringing the virus and the uh, target membranes closer together, almost like snares do. Um, and this allows for the virus to kind of be enveloped by the cell. And the cell actually brings the virus in as a little vesicle at that point. And so like how we have snares to allow a vesicle and a plasma membrane to interact, the flu has its own snare-like protein to go and invade um, our cells. And you could imagine that um, this, this protein would be a good drug candidate in that if you can inhibit influenza from recognizing um, the cells to invade, then you wouldn't get sick. So um, that could be one possible thing you could target if you wanna stop the flu from making people sick. So here's a question um, about influenza and hemagglutinin. And I believe I do have a poll question. So to get us started for today, yeah. We're gonna do a little bit of uh, critical thinking here in that you are a researcher and you want to develop a drug to help treat the flu. Based on the influence of virus, the information that you know, which of the following reactions would be good for this new drug? That's probably the best way I could put it. Based on the information presented on the last slide, how do you think we could we could affect this? All right, let's end it there. Um, so what I was expecting people to select because we only briefly talked about it 
is I was expecting people to select C um, because that, that hemagglutinin, um, that is what is interacting with our uh, target cell. And so if you can bind that, right, and make it change without, you know, having the cell present, there's no way that the virus could then go and infect you, right? So the idea is, is that you bind that, you make a change confirmations and now the virus is stuck because it needs that to um, invade. It's its its own snares. Um, so that's all I really want us to know about um, influenza virus at this point. Those of you who actually read the chapter, read the book, um, the actual answer is D. We didn't talk about it, so don't worry about uh, the other, other things. So what I would say about that is make sure you know about hemagglutinin and make sure uh, you know what that phrase means, like how it's analogous to a snare. So uh, make sure we have that information uh, for the test. If you are really interested, like if you are really interested in viruses um, and influenza and you want to know the biochemistry of that, um, uh, go. I, uh, I strongly suggest that you read this section in the book if you haven't yet. It does go into more in depth of how the virus invades the cell. Um, and then you should see that, oh, A and B, it will it'll talk about those things. But for our purposes, since we have a lot to cover, um, I would be happy with just C. But honestly, it's, 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 it is all of the above. All right, let's get to math now. My favorite subject, thermodynamics. So we're gonna we're gonna talk about some math equations here. Um, and in your book, we go through the derivation of all of these, but we don't need to be worried about the derivation. All I care when it comes to math for this section is that we know how to do it, period, right? So what we're talking about in this thermodynamics uh, section is the diffusion of a substance. And we're just, in our example, we're looking at a substance A, right? So, and in and out means inside the cell. So here you're outside the cell, here you're inside the cell. So we're gonna calculate the energy of transportation inside and outside the cell. And so with the delta G of the transport of A, that's what that's saying here. And if you um, don't remember, delta G is more or less free energy. Um, here, we're, we're, it's a little more specific in that it's electrochemical potential. What you need to remember is that if you get a negative energy, that means it is spontaneous. If you get a positive energy, that is non-spontaneous. Okay, so the energy of movement equals R. R is, the, R is a gas constant, so that's always a constant. Multiplied by T, T is going to be like always in Kelvin. Multiplied by natural log, concentration of your final destination, that's what the final means, divided by uh, concentration of your initial place that you were. Uh, when you read this in the book, they won't use final and initial. Um, what they use, I, I find a little more confusing. Um, so it's always going to be where you end up at divided by where you started from. Okay. Plus Z, Z is the ionic charge of our molecule that we're looking at. Um, teaching this class for a couple of years now, people are always confused about Z, what, how you calculate Z. So let's just go over it. So sodium plus, the um, ionic charge of sodium is plus one as, as shown by that plus. So Z for sodium is plus one. Oxygen minus two. Uh, the charge of oxygen here is minus two. So Z of oxygen would be minus two. Right, chlorine minus one. 
the charge of chlorine is minus one. So Z of chlorine is minus one. It's just the charge of our, our ion. Whatever the charge symbol is, that's what Z is, right? So this A, this is actually supposed to be a lowercase. So Z of A multiplied by Faraday's constant. Um, so Faraday is just a constant. So that's always a given. Multiplied by the change in electric potential. Uh, so this means membrane potential, and it's your final location minus your initial location. So what's the charge of your final location minus the charge of your initial location? So that's all we need to know to calculate um, transportation um, free energy. So what we're going to do for the next little bit here is that we are going to struggle through how to use this equation. So I have a sodium potassium pump. I transport two potassium ions into the cell and three sodium ions out of the cell. The membrane potential of the cell is minus 100 millivolts. That's, that is the inside is, uh, is negative and the outside is positive, right? My extracellular fluid has 140 millimolar sodium, five millimolar potassium. Cytosol, 10 millimolar sodium, 100 millimolar potassium. What's delta G if I'm transporting two moles of potassium and three moles of sodium? And is this reaction spontaneous? All right, so you should have all the information you need to solve this. So T of the cell is given. R is given, uh, the equation is given, and Faraday's constant is given. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give people like uh, five to 10 minutes to try and solve this. Um, your step should be, one, draw a picture of exactly what's going on. That will help a lot. Two. Uh, just focus on one ion. It doesn't matter which one. So let's say we're focusing on sodium. Uh, assign your constants for sodium. Calculate delta G. Do the same thing for potassium. Assign constants. Calculate delta G. Four, add steps two and three together to get overall delta G. If you have questions or if you actually get an answer and you want to check with me, let me know. Um, otherwise, I'm going to give you this time now um, to actually try and solve this. So let's see how far you can get. Um, and yeah, let's let's just let's just see how far we can get on this.
All right, so I'll draw us the picture in case you're, you still haven't gotten that yet. So here's our picture. We have our cell. Um, so two potassium go in. Three come out. Three sodium come out. Membrane potential minus 100 millivolts inside. Uh, the extracellular fluid is 140 millimolar sodium, 5 millimolar potassium. Cytosol, 10, oops, 10 millimolar sodium, 100 millimolar potassium. I always find it super helpful to have something like that written that I can follow along when I'm doing my calculations. And just a reminder, every time you see delta, that's always final minus initial. So I'm gonna calculate uh, sodium for us. Okay, so delta G of sodium equals R, so 8.314, multiplied by T. Well, here I give you a T in Celsius and you need to be in Kelvin because that's what your gas constant is. So 37 plus 273 equals 310, two times 310 times the natural log of final divided by initial. So sodium is leaving the cell. So my final calculation is outside, which is 140, divided by my initial uh, concentration. So inside was 10 millimolar, so that was my initial, plus Z, charge of sodium, sodium's plus one, so one, times Faraday's constant, 96,485, multiplied by my change in membrane potential, which is final minus initial in volts. So membrane potential has to be in volts because Faraday's constant is also in volts. All right, so this always tricks people up. Um, so I'm just gonna write it down what it is and tell you why I did that. So it's final minus initial. So final is zero minus initial 100, which just means, or sorry, 0 0.100, because I need to be in volts. All right, so how did I determine what's final and what's an initial uh, uh, membrane potential? So when, when I say the inside, the membrane potential is minus 100, that is, um, the in, and I say the inside's negative. What that actually means is that if you compare the charge on the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell, they are different by 100 millivolts. And I'm saying that the inside is a negative charge. 
So one way I can make that math work out is if I say the outside has a charge of zero volts or millivolts, that's or volts, yeah, it should be volts. Of zero volts, that's what I'm doing right here. And I'm saying that the difference between the outside and the inside is 100 millivolts. Well, the outside zero, the inside has to be uh, negative 0 0.100 volts or 100 millivolts. Um, generally, what you can do is if I say the membrane potential is some number, and if I say the inside's negative, you just make the outside zero. If I say the outside's negative, you just do the opposite. Just say the inside zero, and the place you're going to is that negative charge, right? Now that should be everything that we need to solve for the delta G of sodium. And so if you put that all into your calculator and do your calculation right, it should be 16,450 if I did my calculation right. Can I repeat that last sentence? So if I say the inside's negative, just set your outside to zero volts and the inside to whatever that voltage was. If I say the outside's negative, the easiest way to do this calculation is to set the inside to zero and the outside to that, that number. I did not get um, 1.96. That's one times 96,485. That's a multiplication symbol. All right. So that's the free energy of transporting one molecule of sodium or one mole of sodium. However, I'm not transporting one mole of sodium and the, the units of this would be uh, joules per mole, right? So it takes 16,450 joules to transport one mole of sodium. But I'm not transporting one mole of sodium, I'm transporting three moles of sodium. So you take your answer, you multiply it by three. So that's how many moles of sodium I'm moving. And so the total energy for the movement of all the sodium is 49,350 joules. Doesn't matter if concentration is molar or millimolar. No, because when you do the natural log, you can only take the natural log of something that is unitless, right? So as long as both of them are molar or both of them are millimolar, it will cancel out. What you cannot do is divide a molar by a millimolar. Both the final and initial concentrations have to be the same unit, but it doesn't matter what the unit is. All right, so that's sodium. Let me do potassium now. Delta G potassium. Okay, same idea. So R, 8.314 multiplied by T, 310 times natural law, final concentration. Well, I'm going inside. So inside the cell, the concentration of sodium is 100, or sorry, not sodium, potassium. And initial, well, I was going from outside to inside. Initially, I was in an area of five millimolar plus the charge of potassium is one multiplied by Faraday's constant, multiplied by my change in membrane potential. So my final location that I'm going to is negative now because I'm going inside the cell. So it's negative 0 0.100 minus zero. So that's my potassium calculation, right? And I, when I did that calculation, I got negative 1,927.48 joules per mole, right? So that's how much energy it takes to transport one molecule of potassium 
But again, I don't have one molecule, I have two molecules. So I need to multiply this by two moles. And the total energy of this transport is negative 300, 3,854 joules. And the last part is add my two energies together and my total delta G for this transportation process is 45,495 joules to move three molecules of sodium outside of the cell plus two molecules of potassium inside. So this pump, which is a real pump in your body, all your cells have this, this pump is not spontaneous. Why did it become negative 0.100? Because I'm moving inside the cell because it's final minus initial. So my final location's inside the cell. You can, you can see it's just the opposite of sodium because one's going inside the cell, one's leaving the cell. So it's always final voltage minus initial voltage. And this does have to be volts. That does matter quite a bit. Final voltage minus initial voltage. And that's why step one, draw a picture to orient yourself. All right, now that you see that all laid out, questions on how I got any of these figures or any of these numbers? I'm sure that all seems very complicated, but once, once you look at the um, equation and look at the pictures, hopefully it'll make sense. How did you get total delta G? I think I missed it. Yeah, all I did was add the G I got from um, sodium plus the G from potassium because the idea is this protein, this pump, this is what it's doing. When it transports three sodium out, two potassium goes in. So I have to, I have to add the delta G of uh, both reactions because they're happening at the same time in the same place, in the same protein. So yep, it's just addition. 49,350 minus 3,854. There's some decimals that's, that I, I haven't included here. All right, so I do have a question for everybody then. I just told you this reaction's not spontaneous. Yet this reaction happens inside our, your cells do this all the time. How do your cells do a reaction that's not spontaneous? How does this happen biologically, biochemistryology? What do you know inside the cell that can make a not spontaneous process spontaneous? Because I'm, I, I'm gonna let you know this. This is a real protein. Mm. This pump is a catalyst almost. So, and, and when catalysts don't lower delta Gs, they just make something faster. So the delta G of a reaction will never change with a catalyst, only reaction speed. So it's not quite catalyst. Electrochemical gradient, nope. The electrochemical gradient is actually not favoring uh, sodium here. ATP is the correct answer, right? So what do we know about ATP from other classes? We know that ATP um, is our energy reserve. Now I'm sure in other classes, you don't go into it in depth and we don't actually go into it in depth here either. That's more biochem too, um, but the cell just doesn't like break an ATP like randomly and get energy. It does something quite more complicated than that. But like I said, we're going to get into actually how ATP works in biochem too.
But basically, when you use one ATP molecule, I want to say that is roughly 47,000 joules of energy that you get out. So to make this reaction run, you just use an ATP and you pump out three potassiums and you let in, uh, or sorry, you pump out three sodiums and you let in three, three potassiums. So yes, to make a not spontaneous process spontaneous inside the cell, you use ATP. All right, so you just saw me work out a problem completely. Um, and this is actually the end of our slideshow. And I'm sure that I will get bombarded for more examples of how to do this. So to save myself some time, how about we go through another example right now? Now that you saw me do one, if you had a little bit of time to muddle through it and know what to do now, we're actually gonna go in, through an example that's on the fall 2019 uh, test three. So I'll show you the question I tested on this. Um, last year and see if you can figure that out. So let me share that. All right, there it is. What is the change in free energy if two molecules of chlorine are transported into the cell and the membrane potential of the cell is minus 70 millivolts? Concentration of Cl outside the cell is 250, inside it is five. And that's all the constants you need right there. So this one's actually a little easier than the problem we just did, because we're only doing one molecule. But see, if you can calculate the free energy of transporting one or two molecules of chlorine into the cell, given all those variables. So I'm gonna give people a little bit of time uh, to do this problem. Another, another example of the problem we just did.
And as always, if you have questions or you think you have an answer, feel free to uh, let me know. All right, so let's try to solve this again. Let's write a, um, or draw a picture. That, will, that always helps me. Here is my cell, right? Okay, so I have two molecules of Cl transported into the cell. The membrane potential of the cell is minus 70. All right, so minus 70. And usually, um, almost always, the inside of the cell would be negative, right? So minus 70 millivolts inside, zero millivolts outside, right? The concentration outside the cell is 250 millivolts. Inside is five millivolts. Um, I did not give a temperature for this problem. So I think I said, use the same temperature that we did. So T, well, some, oh, there it is. Yeah, I see it now, sorry. T equals 37. C, which is 310 uh, Kelvin. Yeah. Just took me a minute to find it. All right, let's solve this. So delta G equals 8.314 joules mole K multiplied by K 310 multiplied by natural log uh, final divided by initial. So my final is five, my initial is 250 um, plus Z, which is minus one multiplied by Faraday's constant, 96,485, multiplied by uh, delta change. So minus 70 point, sorry, minus 0 0.70. Remember it has to be in volts. So negative 0 0.70 minus zero for final minus initial. So we do that and then since we are talking about two moles here, everything has to be multiplied by two. You basically do this twice. Yeah, sorry, good, good call, negative 0 0.07, negative 0 0.07 volts. 
and then do my conversion right in my head. All right, and so I haven't redone this calculation since I did last year. So I'm just relying on the work I did last year. So hopefully I didn't do it wrong, but I got negative, let's see, 6657. I got negative 6657. And what was my units? Kilojoules. So I will take just a second to see if I, I'm gonna redo this on Excel to see if I still agree with 2019 version of me. So equals 8.314 times 310 times natural log of two uh, five divided by 250. That's a negative big number. Um, so 96,485 times negative 0.7 negative one. Six, seven, five, zero equals A1 plus A2 plus A3 times two. Uh, so it should be six, six, five, seven joules, not kilojoules. Uh, that's where I slightly disagree with myself. That's joules. Yeah, getting the getting the right uh, joules and millijoules conversion is important. So now that you saw two of these, and you should probably expect um, this question on test four. Is there any questions about how I did any of these calculations? Because I'm gonna like 100% guarantee you're gonna see this again in the not so distant future. And I'm not saying it's gonna be as easy as what I gave in the fall. I might give you something like we did um, on the PowerPoint. Right, well, if you don't have any questions, that's all I wanted to cover today. I really wanted to have, give us a good amount of time to practice with this equation, um, as this is an equation that um, always gives people trouble of how to use it. So I just wanna make sure that uh, we're given sufficient time to do that. Otherwise, we will start on a new PowerPoint on Wednesday, which will look at uh, transportation, um, the actual proteins that will do transportation now that we looked at thermodynamics. Um, I will put up a homework for us to do that will probably have another example of this to give you more practice. Otherwise, um, I have nothing left for you today. So have a good rest of your Monday, everybody. Take care.